In this lecture, you'll learn about Flash Cache. It's an ONTAP VST, that's Virtual Storage Tiering Technology, which increases the size of your system memory cache and the read performance on your controllers. You learned about how reads and writes work on the system, and the system memory cache in the last lecture. And this lecture really follows on from there. So let's summarize that last lecture first. In the diagram here, you can see it's the same as what we were using in the last lecture. And we've got aggregate one, which is owned by controller one, and controller one's HA peer is controller two. Whenever a write comes into the system for aggregate one, let's say that it hits a network port on controller one, that write request is going to be written into system memory on controller one, and it's going to be written into NVRAM on controller one and controller two. As soon as the data has been written into system memory and NVRAM on both controllers, an acknowledgement will be sent back to the client. So that acknowledgement gets sent back to the client before it's written to disk. It's much faster to write to memory than it is to disk, so this improves performance. And we're able to do that because of the system memory and the NVRAM in the controllers. But there's only so much system memory and NVRAM. When NVRAM is half full, it's time to write the data to the disk. That happens in a consistency point. So when that happens, the data that hasn't been written to disk yet gets written down there with a consistency point, and then we flush or empty NVRAM, and we can start again. The reason that this happens when NVRAM is half full rather than completely full is that writing the data to the disk take some time and we're still going to have some writes coming in while that's happening so we need to leave some space in nvram for those new writes so that's why we do it when it's half full not completely full okay so when the consistency point writes the data to the aggregates nvram is emptied and we start again we do not empty system memory though because system memory improves the read performance of the system. We want to make the best use of that. So we want system memory to be full with the hottest, that's the most frequently and most recently accessed data as possible. So that was how our writes work. With our reads, whenever a read request comes in, the controller, which owns the aggregate that the data is on, will first look in system memory, and if the data is there, it will serve it from system memory. If the data is not in system memory, then it will fetch it from disk and send it to the client. If it does that, the data now becomes hot, so it will go into the top slot in system memory, and everything else will be bumped down a slot. And again, for the reads, it's best if the read is served from the system memory because it's much faster to serve the data from there than it is from disk. And whenever there's a read or a write request on the system, that data goes into the top slot on memory and everything gets bumped down a slot. The reason that we have both system memory and NVRAM, system memory is used as the cache that improves the performance on the system. But system memory uses DRAM, dynamic RAM, which does not survive a power outage. Now, if we just had system memory and we didn't have NVRAM, then what could happen is a client writes data to the system, it goes into system memory, it immediately gets the acknowledgement back, and then as far as the client is concerned, that has been written to permanent storage. If we had a power outage on the controller, before the consistency point wrote the data down to the disks, then that data would be gone. It would be lost, and we would now have an inconsistent state. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. We need to make sure that we don't lose the data, and that's what the NVRAM is used for. NVRAM is non-volatile RAM, meaning we don't lose the contents if there's a power outage. So if we had been writing data 
to the system. It's in system memory. It's in NVRAM as well. So if we did have a power outage of controller one, we'll lose the contents of system memory, but we've still got the contents of NVRAM. So we haven't lost that data. So system memory is used as a, a read cache and to improve the performance. NVRAM is used just as a backup log. Whenever we are writing data to the disks, that always happens from the system memory. And for sending the data and the acknowledgement back to the clients, that comes from the system memory as well. NVRAM is never going to be communicating directly with the clients. Okay, so I think that pretty much wraps up the summary of what we covered in the last lecture. Looking at the diagram now, I can see that what has happened leading up to this point is we've got a lot of data in system memory. System memory is actually full. And right now we've just got the blue data in NVRAM. So we've done a consistency point quite recently. Since the last consistency point, we've just had one write, which has been for the blue data. And since then, we've had read requests for the green data and then the red data. I can see that because they are at the top of the system memory cache. And where we're at right now is NVRAM has still got quite a bit of space, but system memory is completely full. So let's see what happens next. And in our example, the next thing that happens is a client sends in a write request for gray data. You already know what's going to happen next. That gets written into system memory and NVRAM on controller one and also into NVRAM on controller two. When it comes in, it goes into the top slot in system memory and everything else gets bumped down a slot. I'm just going to go back one slide and notice that we had the yellow data was in the bottom slot in system memory just before we had this write come in. So the write comes in, the gray data goes into the top slot in system memory, everything else gets bumped down a slot. And because the system memory is full, the yellow data gets bumped out of there and it's no longer in the cache. If a client then sent in a read request for that yellow data, well, it's not in the cache anymore. So it would have to be fetched from disk. It then does go into the top slot in the system memory and everything else gets bumped down a slot but that's not as fast as we would have been able to serve the client if the yellow data had still been in the cache. So obviously, the more cache that you've got, the more data that you can store in there. So the higher the chance of success of the data being served from the cache and the better the performance you're going to get from the system. So you want to have as much system memory cache as possible. And a way that you can extend it is with flash cache. Flash Cache 2 is a PCI Express card that fits into an expansion slot on your controller chassis. It currently comes in sizes of 512 gig, one terabyte, and two terabytes. And most recently, it's also now available as NVM SSD up to four terabyte in size. So what Flash Cache does is it extends the size of your system memory and flash cache sits below the level of the system memory. So the state right now is we've got the yellow data at the top of the cache and we've got blue data down at the bottom of the cache. The next thing that happens is we have a client sends in a read request for purple data. The system will first check the system memory cache to see if it's there. In this example, it's not. So it will then fetch it from disk. It will put that purple data in the top slot in system memory and everything will then get bumped down a slot. Now, if we didn't have flash cache, this blue data that was in the bottom slot in system memory would have just been evicted from the cache. It wouldn't be there anymore. But because we've added flash cache, which again is very fast storage, it is now going to get bumped down to there. So we've still got it in a fast cache. Next thing that happens in our example is a client sends in a read request for the blue data. If we didn't have flash cache, this would have had to have been fetched from disk, but because we do have flash cache, it's now there. The controller one will first check its system memory to see it's, if it's there. It's not. 
it will then check flash cache and it sees that it is there. So the data can be served from flash cache, which is much quicker than serving it from disk. The data is immediately sent back to the client and then that data becomes the hottest data now. So it gets put into the top slot in the system memory and everything else gets bumped down a slot. So when a read request is received, the storage system looks for the data in system memory first, then flash cache, and then disk. So you can see it's hierarchical with system memory at the top, then the flash cache, and then your disks. Some information about flash cache, it's plug and play. So basically you just fit the card into the system and you're done. There are a few little tweaks that you can make, but it's basically just install it physically and you don't need to touch anything. It improves performance for random reads, as you saw there in the examples. It does not improve your write performance, it improves your read performance. And it improves performance for all the aggregates on a controller. Flash cache works at the controller level. And as I said, it's basically plug and play. You don't configure it for anything. You don't target particular sets of data with it. It improves the performance for all of the data on a controller. You can say that's both a good and a bad thing. It's good that it improves the performance for everything, but you can't target a particular set of data with it. It's all or nothing. You either, either have it and it improves the performance for everything, or you don't have it, and obviously then it doesn't. Um, if there's an HA takeover, then the cache is lost. Let me just go back to the diagram to explain that. So you can see here, that we're looking at controller one here. We've got flash cache in there and we've been talking about aggregate one. The, the cache that is used is on controller one. We don't use the cache on controller two. It's deliberately designed like this because you've only got so much cache and you don't want to waste it. So controller one is used to cache data that is owned by controller one. Controller two is used to cache data that is owned by controller two. So under normal operations, controller two does not have any information in its cache about data that is stored on aggregates owned by controller one. That's a good thing because it means we can use this memory cache for the data which is owned by controller two. But if controller one does fail, then what's going to happen is controller two is going to take over its aggregates and it doesn't have any data in its cache about those aggregates. It can still serve the data, but all of those first read requests are going to have to be served from disk to start off with. Over time, the memory cache and controller two will build information, but when the failover first happens, the cache is going to be empty. It's going to take some time to warm up that cache again. Okay, last thing to tell you about is virtual storage tiering. I mentioned right in the intro there that flash cache is a VST technology. So data is typically accessed less as it ages. That's a natural thing to happen. And storage tiering can automatically move data to lower performance storage as it is less frequently accessed. So with storage tiering technologies, they're gonna be running typically in software, and what this can do is it can analyze your data and it can see what's hot data, meaning that it's being frequently and recently accessed, and what is cold data, meaning it hasn't been accessed for a while. And obviously that's going to change over time. Maybe you're running a project right now and you're going to be accessing the data related to that project a lot. But when the project is completed, it's going to be not so much, right? And with storage tiering technologies, it automates the process of moving the data onto the most suitable storage. You could do this manually, but everybody's busy. We've got other things that we need to be doing. It would be great if the system could automatically do this by analyzing the data, seeing whether it's being used a lot or not. And when it's not being used, it can automatically move it to lower performance storage. So that is what storage tiering does. Now, back in ONTAP version 8, NetApp did not have a traditional storage tiering solution, meaning it was not built into the system that it could look at the data 
and move the data off to lower performance storage somewhere. With traditional storage tiering, what we're typically talking about there would be, for example, keeping your hot data on SSDs and then moving the cold data onto spinning disks, either on the same system or maybe even on a different system. So traditional storage tiering can do that. NetApp was, did not really have that capability in ONTAP 8. And this gave them a bit of a problem in the market because maybe you had an IT manager that needed to buy a storage system. They weren't really a storage expert, so they just had a laundry list of features that they wanted to take off. And NetApp were not able to say that they supported storage tiering. So maybe that IT manager would go and buy a system from a different vendor. So NetApp wanted to be able to say that they could support storage tiering. So what they did was they said that flash cache and flash pool, which you'll learn about in the next lecture, are virtual storage tiering. Because if I go back to the diagram again, you can see that there is a hierarchy of the storage here. We've got the system memory at the top, then flash cache underneath, and then our disks. So it is kind of storage tiering, but you would not class this as traditional storage tiering because what that really means, as I said earlier, would typically be keeping your hot data on SSDs and your, your colder data on spinning disks, for example, on the same or a different system. This is kind of similar to that, but it's not really doing it. So NetApp did call it virtual storage tiering just to get the tick in the checkbox to say that they did storage tiering, but wasn't really the same thing. However, since ONTAP 9 came out, there is a feature with that called Fabric Pool, and Fabric Pool is fully featured traditional storage tiering. So NetApp can now don't need to say that they just do virtual storage tiering. They can truly say that they do support full featured storage tiering. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands on practice with NetApp storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.